Well, good morning, everybody. It is my absolute pleasure uh, to get to start today and welcome you all here. Really is one of our favorite days of the week when we get to come see you all, connect with you, chat. Uh, welcome here. We're so glad that you've joined us. It's my pleasure this morning to get to call us to a place of worship. And to do that, we're going to be reading Psalm 95, verses 1 to 3 and 6 to 7. Uh, I want to encourage us all, if you have a Bible handy, turn to it. Uh, as we're turning, uh, I do just want to say I realize that we're at a place where a lot of us are quite anxious. Some of us have had a lot of worries, a lot of stress come up this past week. As we read the psalm together, allow it to focus you. And let's focus solely on God so that when we're worshiping, when we're listening to the message, when we're listening to the word, we're focused entirely on him. Let this focus you. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Let's worship. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Who love and mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder?
What is worship? Put simply, worship is when we sing, when we give, when we pray, and when we read and hear God's Word. Today, we're going to spend some time listening to God's Word together, but first, let's pray. Dear God, we just want to say a huge thank you for this time together. God, it really is incredible that no matter where we are, we can come together uh, during this time and, and celebrate you and all the things that you've done in our lives. So God, as we worship, let's worship together. Would you give us the ability to look past the obvious obstacles that we have right now and worship you as the church fully right now? God, would you speak to our hearts? Would you speak clearly through the word? And God, we again just want to say a huge thank you for the opportunity that you have provided by doing this. In your holy name we pray. Amen. So things I've been doing to encourage people during this pandemic. The first thing I did was I drew pictures and put them up in my window so when people walk by, they have a boost of encouragement. The second thing I did was I made a whole bunch of cards and I randomly taped them to my neighbor's doors so when they either opened them to get some fresh air or came home, they would find a card there. The third thing I did was I wrote a letter to Justin Trudeau. I wanted to give him some encouragement because some people aren't being very nice to him and even the people who are leading us need some encouragement. The fourth thing I did was me and my mom just last week made dog cookies. We put them in bags with a purple ribbon and made a little sticker and we dropped them off to people's houses that we knew had dogs. That's pretty much what I've been doing to stay busy during this pandemic. Sometime later, Paul said, let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Paul chose Silas and left Antioch. Paul came to Derby, then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, and Paul wanted to take him along on the journey. By this time, this traveling missionary troop was made up of Paul and Barnabas, Timothy and Luke. Luke is the one writing the story down, and that's why the telling of the story changes from he to we, because Luke is a part of the group. This is a big journey. His next trip was much further. Around 49 AD, he walked to Tarsus, then Cilicia, Derby, Lystra, Iconium, Phrygia. That sounds cold. I don't think it was. Then up to an area called Galatia, and all the way over to another called Mysia, then Troas, and then he visited Samothrace, Neapolis, Philippi, Amphipolis, Apollonia, Thessalonica, Berea, then all the way down to Athens, which is the center of Greek culture, then over to Corinth, where he stayed for a year and a half, then Sankri, then back on our boat and all the way over to Ephesus, then all the way down back across the Mediterranean, all the way to Caesarea. Whoa, what a long trip. And then to Jerusalem, 2,800 miles. He must have worn out his sneakers. I think he wore out several pair of sneakers. God told Paul in a dream to go to the Roman province of Macedonia, where Philippi was a major city. It was there where they met two women. Lydia was a good person who believed in Jesus. The other was a slave girl whose story is a part of one of the best known stories in the book of Acts. God's story, Paul and Silas. So part of God's story is about two men named Paul and Silas and it begins like this. Paul and Silas were friends who decided they wanted to serve God. 
Serving somebody means you try to help them. It can be as easy as holding open a door or setting the table, or as difficult as scraping chewed gum off the bottom of their shoes or worse, picking out the lint from their belly button. Thankfully, God doesn't need help like that. God wanted Paul and Silas to help him by telling his story to others. God's story is all about his love. God is the main character and he loves everyone and wants everyone in the whole world to know him. Do you think you can tell people God's story? One day, Paul and Silas were in a city called Philippi. Some of the people there didn't want to hear about God's story and they got really, really mad at Paul and Silas for telling the story every single day. In fact, they got so mad, they beat up Paul and Silas right in the middle of the street. Then they threw Paul and Silas in jail. Now remember, Paul and Silas were just trying to tell them about God. And now they found themselves behind bars in prison. Once they were in jail, you might think Paul and Silas got scared to keep serving God. But they didn't. In fact, they wanted to worship God. Worshiping can be playing an instrument, singing, praying, listening, sharing your things with people who need them, and other stuff too. But all those things are a way to show you really love God. Anyway, Paul and Silas decided to worship by singing songs to God. They sing so loud, the whole jail could hear. It was like having a dance party right there in prison. Kind of weird, huh? But that's what Paul and Silas were doing. Sometimes you can look a little weird when you're serving others or worshiping God, but that's okay. Well, God was with Paul and Silas. Right in the middle of their dance party, a huge earthquake began to shake the whole jail. All the doors swung open and Paul and Silas' handcuffs fell right off their hands. They were free. So, what do you think Paul and Silas did? Well, they knew that if they ran away, the jail guard would be punished for losing his prisoners. Paul and Silas didn't want that to happen, so they decided to stay in jail, even though the doors were open. When the earthquake was over, the guard thought he was in big trouble. He felt more sad than he had ever felt in his whole life. But suddenly, Paul yelled out, We're all still here. Nobody's run away. The guard was so surprised and happy that he invited Paul and Silas over for dinner and to spend the night. But it might seem strange that the guard was going to get in big trouble if the prisoners were gone, and then he took two of them home with him. But that's what he did. Well, the guard's family was so happy, he didn't get into trouble that they listened to Paul and Silas tell God's story. Because the story is such good news, the family realized God loves them. They decided they wanted to be a part of God's story too. Paul and Silas were allowed to go home the next morning. They knew now that serving God would be hard sometimes. But they decided that even if people were going to get mad at them, ask them to help them with things they didn't want to do, beat them up, send them to jail again, or worse, they would still keep on serving God by telling his story. And that's the story of Paul and Silas. So in case you missed it, here's the quick version. Paul and Silas were two friends. They wanted to serve God. They told people God's story. Some people didn't want to hear it. Those people threw Paul and Silas in jail. Paul and Silas weren't scared. They had a dance party to worship God. God opened the jail doors with an earthquake. Paul and Silas stayed to tell the jail guard about God. They went free and kept on serving God. And that's a part of God's story. A lot of places this missionary team went to are familiar because Paul would later write letters to many of the churches started in these cities. Philippi, Thessalonica, Corinth, and Ephesus. There were other cities as well, like Berea and Athens. As usual, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power as many people believed. But there were those who attacked Paul and his group for sharing the message of Jesus. There was trouble in Corinth and a riot in Ephesus. But through it all, God kept Paul and his friends safe and the message of Jesus went out to more and more people who believed. So unusual, it's frightening. You see right through this mess inside me. You call me out to pull me in. You tell me I can start again. And I don't need to keep on hiding. I'm fully known. And loved by you You won't let go No matter what I do It's not like one or the other It's 
taught truth and ridiculous grace to be known, fully known and loved by you. I'm fully known and loved by you. It's so like you to keep pursuing. It's so like me to go astray. Got my heart with your truth The kind of love is bulletproof And I surrender to your kindness I'm fully known And loved by you You won't let go No matter what I do It's not like one or the other Hard truth and ridiculous grace to be known, fully known and loved by you. I'm fully known and loved by you. How real, how wide, how rich, how high is your heart? I cannot find the why you give me so much how real how rich how high is your heart i cannot find the reasons why you give me so much i'm fully known and loved by you i won't let go not like one or the other it's hard truth and ridiculous grace to be known fully known and loved by you i'm fully known and loved by you it's so unusual it's frightening By you. Long before there was a Tom Cruise, I was a fan of Mission Impossible. I watched the TV show when I was growing up and I saw Tom Cruise turn it into a major uh, motion picture that was uh, duplicated. In fact, there are six Mission Impossible films and there are two more in production right now, one set for release in 2021, another set for release in 2022. And whether you're looking at the TV show or whether you're looking at the movies, they all begin with a call to the mission, your mission, should you decide to accept. And then it would unfold this impossible mission that they would stand up and accomplish. Well, God has a mission. And he has a mission for his crack team, his A team. And he wants to put you on that A team. He wants you to step up and be part of that mission. And he says, your mission, should you choose to accept, is that I want you to turn this world right side up. It's been turned upside down. It's, it's gone the way it shouldn't have gone. Sin has gotten in and, and it needs the message of salvation in Jesus Christ. And I want you to be a part of that. I want you to carry that mission so that this world can be righted, so the people can come to faith. And I want you to be a part of that. And when we think of that, then we have to ask the question, well, if, if I'm on his crack team, if I'm on his A team, if I'm on his Mission Impossible team, what if I fail? Like, like what if I don't get it done? What if people don't, because of me, don't come to faith, don't trust in Christ? Well, what he says here is, no, understand this. God is judging you on your engagement, not on your fulfillment. God does not evaluate you on whether you complete the mission, but whether you even pursue the mission. 
whether you can stand up and be counted because the success of this mission is not on its fulfillment, but on its engagement. It's not on how we do the task, but it's whether or not we go. Paul went. As we come to this section in the book of Acts, it's his second missionary journey. It's his biggest missionary journey. It's his biggest in terms of team. He collects a whole team. The first missionary journey, we all we know is that there was uh, Paul and Barnabas. In this one, the two prominent people are Paul and Silas. But he picks up Timothy, and he picks up Luke, and there's indications that he picks up others, and he's got a little entourage that he's carrying around with him, and he's ready to go. He's ready to stand up and be counted and say, you can count on me. But as he goes, if he's going to put the fact that he's being faithful and answering the call first, then we need to understand a few things as we come that we see in this section as we come to Paul and his engagement in the mission. And the first is that he's going to concentrate on the objective, not on the plans. He's going to concentrate on the great big objective, not on the details of the plans. Well, it doesn't mean he didn't plan. We should plan. That old adage, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail, is as true today as it ever was. We need to plan, we need to strategize, we need to think about what we're gonna do, but we need to hold them lightly and openly so that we're prepared, as Paul was, to be directed by the Spirit wherever the Spirit wants us to go. Our plans we hold loosely, our objective we hold absolutely. And that's what Paul did. His great objective was to share the gospel, it was to make Christ known. And he had plans. His plan was to go to Asia, and then it was to go to Bithynia. In Paul's plans, he had no plan at all to go to Macedonia. But look what happened. It says in Acts 16, verse 9, During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia stand and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And after Paul had seen this vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. You see, Paul's objective, as I said, was simply to preach the gospel wherever that could happen, wherever it would happen, wherever, and he was open to the direction of the Spirit. So he made plans as to where he was going to go, but when he gets this message, he says, this must be from God. And my plans are incidental. The objective is all important. So by all means, let's make our plans. Let's spend time strategizing who we are, how we can best accomplish what, uh, as we understand it, what God would have us do individually in my own life, collectively, as Burnett Fellowship in our community of Maple Ridge. We should be open to, uh, we, we should be strategic in planning, but we need to be open to God's surprises. Where is it that God is leading? I, I think this whole coronavirus is a, is a surprise for us. A year ago, we had no idea that we would be in this situation and doing church in this way and having connections or a lack of connection with people and, and having to rebuild our whole lines of communication. Accept this from God the Spirit directing us and changing our plans while we concentrate on the objective. Because God has you here to enlist people to heaven. God leaves you on earth so that you might have an impact and your objective is, is to share your hope in Christ with others. That's the objective. And how that works itself out can change along the way. But not only did Paul see that the objectives were more important than his plans in his call to Macedonia, but we also understand that he was focused on God. He was God-centered, not fearful. 
If he looked at the circumstances around him, what was happening to him personally, he would be full of fear. Uh, things didn't go very well. We noticed that last week in the escalation of pressure and persecution, even the stoning of Paul. And it doesn't let up in this section either. There is opposition to the gospel. And, and Paul, if he looked at that, could be fearful. But instead, he remained focused on God. And the reality is, if we are focused on people coming to faith and feeling that that responsibility is ours, that we are the ones who have to make that kind of thing happen and so on, we put a pressure on ourselves that will cause us to worry about the results. And it's not our responsibility to worry about the results. It's not our responsibility to be fearful. It is our responsibility to focus on God and be faithful. And when we are focused on God and faithful to Him, then whatever happens, we can, we can have joy. It, it fills up our joy quotient because uh, Paul and Barnabas in this section, or Paul and Silas rather in this section, uh, find themselves in jail. And even though they find themselves in jail, it, it, it doesn't say they were so depressed that they wept and they cried and they despaired of their lives. It says that in the middle of the night, they're singing and praising God and praying. Why? Because they're God-centered. We're here by God's design, by God's plan, by the Spirit's movement. And so we are not afraid. We are faithful. And the result of that was the conversion of a jailer. They'd already seen a few other people come to faith in Philippi. But now the jailer who was in charge of looking after them comes to faith. Look at how the story unfolds again. After Paul and Silas had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and at once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. And the result of that was that the, the jailer came in ready to take his own life because he feared that he had lost all of his prisoners. And Paul said, don't injure yourself, we are here. And, and out of that, he said that this is unusual. What prisoner wouldn't have tried to escape? So there must be something to these men. And he invited them into his home and he and his house are saved and they're baptized and they come into the family of God. Why? All because Paul and Silas are not fearful in prison. They're not worried about the circumstances that they might run up against because they are so God-centered, they are so focused on Him and desiring to be faithful. It doesn't matter that they face persecution, even prison. It doesn't get them down. Their joy is in God, and the success of their mission is in its, not in its fulfillment, but in their engagement. Are we going to be faithful to God? Are we going to do what He wants? The success of the mission is not in its fulfillment, but in our engagement in the process. So therefore, we need to be ready, not reticent, not holding back. We need to be ready. This, I guess, is kind of where the plans come in. We don't make our plans for what we're going to do or where we're going to do it, but we, we plan and we strategize how can I convey this part of the message and take on this responsibility of engagement? That's where we need focus. And we need to be ready when the opportunity comes. One of my favorite all-time Winston Churchill stories involves Winston Churchill and Lady Astor. They were both members of Parliament and they didn't like each other very much. And in their dislike for each other, there were barbed, uh, comments that were made between each other constantly. And one day in the House of Commons in Britain, Lady Astor shouted across the, the aisle to Winston Churchill. She said, Mr. Churchill, if I were your wife, 
I would put arsenic in your tea. And without batting an eye, Winston Churchill says, Ah, and Lady Astor, if you were my wife, I should drink it. Well, I got a great laugh and Churchill one up on Lady Astor that day. But afterwards, a reporter caught up to Sir Winston Churchill and said, uh, how, how is it that you were so quick and so spontaneous with that response? And Winston Churchill said, I wasn't, I, I, no, you misunderstand. I wasn't spontaneous. I thought of that response a long time ago. It has just taken this long for Lady Astor to spring the trap. In other words, what he was saying is, I thought about this. I was prepared. I was ready so that I could step in when the opportunity came. And much of our reticence in sharing the gospel, I think, comes because we're not ready. We're not prepared. We, we Maybe we don't fully know the message in the way in which we should, or we don't know how to engage in conversation. We don't know how to turn the conversation around to the subject. We don't know how to start. We, we, uh, part of it may be an embarrassment that we're forcing our views on someone else, which is a fear that we have that's greatly exaggerated in the day and age in which we live. But, but some of it may be that fear. But more of it is uh, we don't know how to start. We don't know the message. We don't know how to convey it in a way that they can be heard. And, and, and so we need to be ready. Paul is ready. I, I see Paul as whenever he comes to a new city, he is examining, where do I go? Where, where is it best to engage in this? And he's strategically thinking so that he can be ready to bear testimony to the Jews. When he comes to Philippi, he heard that there were uh, some people who met outside the city by a riverbank who, who were God-fearers, but they might not be welcome in the synagogue. Oftentimes, he would go to a city and say, ah, the best place for me to start is the synagogue. When he arrives in Athens, Paul looks around and he says, wow, this is a religious town. I mean, they, they've got temples on every corner. And they've got idols to every god imaginable, more than I even know by name. And then he discovers uh, an idol, a statue. And it says on the inscription, this one's to the unknown God. And in their fear, these religious people were afraid that they might have overlooked one of the gods. And so that God might be upset with them because they weren't showing enough respect and deference to him or her. And so they put up this idol and said, this is to the unknown God, just to make sure we've got everybody covered. And Paul says, now I know my entrance. And notice what Paul says. It says, while Paul was waiting in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. And Paul stood up and said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. And Paul says, this is a great avenue into talking to them about Jesus. They don't know Jesus, and he's the unknown God. In fact, he's the only real God at all. And I love the fact that Paul evaluated his circumstances and was ready so that he wouldn't be reticent. Do you have a point of engagement? Have you figured out a way in which you can begin a conversation and be prepared to step up and to do it? I think this is one of the benefits of, of having, a, having a, a way of presenting the gospel. There are a number. Uh, one might be um, the bridge illustration that man is on one side and God is on the other side and there's this great chasm of sin that's in between and separates us from God. But Jesus came and died on the cross and that becomes the bridge by which sinful man gets to God. 
It might be our testimony and that we have our testimony down and to give in such a way that we can just say, this is about me. Might not work for you, but you know, this is my life. And this is what I have found to be true. It might be the Roman road. The Roman road is, uh, uh, is all has sinned and come short of the glory of God and uh, the wages of sin is death and, and uh, their uh, salvation in Christ. And, and the Roman road takes verses from the book of Romans and, and that just explains the gospel. And there are many others. But the, the point is, there is value in being ready and having something like that in your pocket. You may not use it fully. You may adapt it to something else as you come along. But we need to be ready, otherwise we will be reticent. We won't step up and speak if we don't know what it is that we have to say. And God says, you're on my A-team. I want you to be engaged in the mission. And you're going to be evaluated for the success of the mission, not on its fulfillment. That's my responsibility as to whether the message is received and responded to by others. That's my responsibility. But your responsibility is to stand up and be engaged. And you will not be engaged if you are reticent because you're not ready with the message. The reality is this. God measures our success, not by what we are doing, but by our faithfulness, the fact that we're doing anything, the fact that we are engaged in the process. Our success is measured by our faithfulness to enlist and be part of his A-team. And sometimes uh, we may look at things and say, I, I don't feel like I'm very successful in this whole process. Uh, but God can take things and turn them in ways that we never expected. I grew up with the story of five young men who one day in a mission aviation plane uh, set off to try and connect with some remote uh, native Indians in South America. Their wives and children were at the home base awaiting their return. But the return never happened. And the return never happened because somewhere that plane came down to try and connect with those Aka Indians. And all five of those men were killed. Later, the plane and the bodies of those five men would be found and discovered. It seemed like such a waste. He, here were five young men ready to do something great for God, and before they could even learn a language or communicate or ever say anything about the gospel, their lives were gone. But here's the incredible thing. Those five men probably did more in the willingness of them to be engaged and to be faithful and to stand and serve God in that way. They probably did more to raise the idea of people giving their lives to the cause of the gospel than anything else that had happened before. Thousands of people have gone into some form of Christian service or been emboldened to tell their stories and share the gospel with others because those five men were willing to give their life for the cause of the gospel. In fact, not too many years after that incident, two of the widows of those men returned to that village and they saw that whole village one to faith in Christ. Did at the time the loss of those five men's lives seem a waste? I'm sure to many people it did. But the success of the mission is not in its fulfillment. It's in our engagement. And I encourage you to get before God and say, God, I am willing. I will do what you want me to do. I don't feel eloquent to speak. I don't feel prepared. I don't feel that uh, I am as centered upon you as I need to be, but I want 
to be engaged. I want to be, I want to pursue the objective of making Christ known and I'll leave the results in your hand. What would happen if we stood up and were counted in that way? That's what God calls us to do even this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love and your grace to us. Encourage us, even in the quietness of this morning, that we might say, God, I want to be part of your crack team. I want to be part of your mission impossible to turn this world right side up. To give a message that causes people to break from their bondage of sin to freedom in Christ. But I will focus not on its fulfillment, but on my faithfulness to be available to you. Use me, I pray. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious, dear, that grace appeared. The All of us have those things that we're afraid of. 
If we were to take a look at a list of fears, right up there with snakes, right up there with spiders, would be public speaking. We're collectively terrified of being pushed out of our comfort zone. In light of that, I want to ask us a question. How inconvenienced am I willing to be in order to accomplish what God desires? I think it's a question that if we truly seek the answer to, we'll see some of the things that are holding us back. And so today, I want to encourage us, as a church, get out there, ask this question of yourself, and share the answer with somebody else. Maybe you'd like to share it with the full group, put it in the chat room. Maybe you have somebody from your life group that you haven't talked to in a while. Phone them up and talk about this. Either way, there is a fantastic chance for us to talk about this with people that we care about today. So I really want to encourage you to do that. We'll see you next week.